Hello and welcome to the Texas Trippet Ranch. Dallas is pretty much only carnivorous plant gallery. This time, uh, for, for this video anyway, our discussion is going to be on Cephalotus, the famed Australian pitcher plant, sometimes called the Albany pitcher plant. This is a plant that is generally found in far southern West Australia, around the town of Albany, hence one of the uh, common names. Its official Latin name is Cephalotus follicularis. The Cephalotus is referring to the head shield up here on top, and the follicularis comes off of the hairs that you see all here along the side. Now, Cephalotus is one of four groups of carnivorous plants found worldwide that are uh, referred to as pitcher plants. However, uh, these are not related to any other variety of carnivorous plant known today. In fact, they honestly uh, don't have any relations anywhere else. Cephalotus is what's referred to as a monotypical genus. That is, there's only one species in with that genus. And it has no close relations left anywhere on Earth. The closest relations it has today, honestly, include uh, roses and apples, the Rosaceae family. The problem is, is that they separated from uh, Cephalotus's ancestors about 90 million years ago, back while the dinosaurs were still in charge and the first flowering plants took off. Now, that's about the only thing that they have in common with any other plant. Now, one of the other uh, interesting aspects here, considering uh, that Cephalotus has been a carnivorous, apparently has been carnivorous for a very, very long time, is that this is the only carnivorous plant that produces leaves that are separate from the traps. Now, you can't really see them over on here all that well because uh, they tend to go ahead and bring them out here during the winter. But you will actually see little uh, little leaves, uh, almost like uh, paddles, that will come on up that are purely for photosynthesis. Every other carnivorous plant around that has uh, leaves adapted for catching prey have uh, that they do not produce a separate leaf form. They may produce uh, variety or variations on that, what are called phyllodia, but in this case, these actually go ahead and produce separate ones. Now, the trap itself works just like any other carnivorous plant. In fact, uh, just as a little side mention, this uh, individual plant over here is uh, it's part of a, what is referred to as a cultivar, a, a particular form that's bred for particular traits. This is the new cultivar Elizabeth that was formally described in 2018. The breeder, a uh, really nice person, I might add, uh, was able to go ahead and get me samples here just before it was formally described. And uh, these have been in this enclosure now for about two years. This is the uh, Antarctica in Decline enclosure. If you go to the Triffid Ranch website, you can uh, go ahead and look under enclosures past and present and go ahead and see all of Antarctica in Decline. And part of the reason why this is called Antarctica in Decline is that because of the uh, current distribution of cephalotus, there is a suspicion that there may have been a lot of uh, cephalotus growing in Antarctica before it froze over. In fact, I love to tell people if I had easy access to time travel, you know, go ahead, borrow my grandmother's TARDIS and go out and visit anywhere I wanted to. Forget going out to go see the Battle of Agincourt. Forget going to Woodstock. No, I'd be hopping back to Antarctica about 30 million years ago with a camera because you'd be pretty much guaranteed that everything you'd be taking pictures of out there would be uh, completely new to science. And one of those would be probably a lot of cephalotus relations that were there that unfortunately, well, we're about three to five million years too late to be able to see, and we can't even get the fossils of them because most of the uh, potential fossil beds are, well, underneath a few kilometers of ice. But anyway, back talking to the, the main structure here, the main thing here is that just like other pitcher plants, uh, Saracenia from uh, North America, uh, Heliamphora from South America, and Nepenthes from Asia, these all have an individual uh, pitcher right on here, as you can see, that actually goes ahead and holds digestive fluid. Now, uh, insects are attracted both by secreting nectar all along the, uh, the lip here and also uh, on the underside of the uh, trap and, or under the underside of the lid, and you'll also see these distinctive patterns. Now, I am gonna, unlike uh, Saracenia or uh, Nepenthes, I have yet to find any cases of these fluorescing under ultraviolet light. 
Uh, many carnivores will fluoresce under ultraviolet. I have yet to find any frequency where cephalotis will uh, fluoresce. That's not saying that it won't. It's just saying that, well, I haven't been able to find it yet, and I haven't heard of anybody else who's found an example of cephalotis fluorescing. That said, one of my suspicions right now, and this is purely non-scientific, is that the uh, particular uh, scalloping that you see along the inside may itself be an attractant in the fact that it, since most insects do see an ultraviolet, they'll at least go ahead and pick up the, the red glow of the uh, chlorophyll inside of the, the plant that at about uh, 380 nanometers, you'll actually see a low red glow coming off of this, just purely off of uh, the chlorophyll inside uh, photosynthesizing. That possibly the uh, between the chlorophyll and then the darker coloration on both the, uh, the lip and the underside of the lid may be enough to go ahead and uh, draw insects in further. Now, one thing that they do have in common, and this is purely convergent evolution with uh, various plants uh, such as Nepenthes is that they have this uh, individual uh, wing or ala that grows up the front. And that's there to allow uh, ground dwelling insects to be able to go ahead and climb up. The difference here is, as you can see with the, this big one here, you have multiple ala there. You've got one on each side and then this big flat uh, paddle here toward the front. So insects are able to go ahead and climb on in, and just like with a Nepenthes, they uh, climb inside and find that the inside is very, very waxy. They go for more nectar glands on the inside, fall inside, and fall into the digestive fluid that's down here on the bottom. When the uh, plants, uh, let's see, they, uh, the insects drown in that, then the plant digests them and is able to go ahead and absorb the uh, nutrients uh, in order to be able to grow in places where other plants can't. Today in Australia, the, uh, ce the cephalotis populations are definitely threatened. They may be endangered here before the end of the decade, mostly due to habitat destruction and due to uh, overcollection. And uh, going ahead and raising these in captivity is going to be absolutely vital in order to take pressure off uh, from uh, poaching and to go ahead and preserve uh, populations that otherwise would die out as, uh, as increases in uh, sea level will go ahead and flood out a lot of those areas. That in fact, uh, many uh, cephalotus can be found directly on top, of, let's see, directly along the ocean and uh, have a distinctive worry about being flooded out here before too long. In any case, uh, the only regret that I have here right now is that I don't have uh, one of these blooming. Cephalotus do bloom. They produce a very large flower scape, a uh, very tall flower scape uh, that uh, honestly goes up about uh, maybe uh, 20 centimeters high at least. Unfortunately, I have yet to be able to go ahead and get one of these to bloom in captivity. That's not saying that I won't be able to here in the future. I just haven't been able to crack it. Now, other than that, a lot of people will ask about the uh, water quality and the, uh, and the soil used to go ahead and grow cephalotis. Now, uh, just as with any other carnivore, I recommend rainwater or distilled water only for cephalotis. Do not take any risks on them. They much prefer uh, very acid conditions. And the last thing you want to do is go ahead and build up salt deposits by using a water that is not as close to pure as possible. As far as soil conditions are concerned, a lot of experts will go ahead and recommend a high mix of uh, sand. Uh, going with uh, sharp sand, pure silica sand in uh, their mix. That's not to say that uh, this is invalid, but what I have found it, in my own personal experience is they grow very, very nicely in uh, clumps of long fiber sphagnum. In fact, as you may notice here, we've got uh, clumps of live sphagnum growing in here. The main concern is making certain that cephalotis does not sit in water. That's uh, very much like a Venus flytrap, that they like it moist, they just cannot handle it too boggy. And so by going ahead and making certain that they're able to come up a few centimeters above the water level in uh, whatever pot or enclosure you're using, they seem to do very well. Again, these have been in here for two years. They're growing very enthusiastically, as well, about as enthusiastically as the cephalotis is gonna go. They're very, very slow growing plants. And as such, this is actually a pretty good size. 
and also to go ahead and show as far as scale, here is my thumb. Now, there are uh, some cephalotis cultivars that will get larger, uh, but not much larger. These are pretty much about as big as you're going to get. In fact, just to go ahead and show here, uh, go ahead and give scale for all the Canadians out here uh, who may be watching. Here's a toonie here inside to give an idea on scale on these. And anybody else who hasn't seen a toonie before, a uh, Canadian $2 coin, feel free to go ahead and look it up online. This will give you an idea of uh, exactly what scale we're working with. In any case, thank you very much for your time. Please feel free to go ahead and visit the website. Uh, that's www.texastrippetranch.com. Uh, I'm not going to go ahead and ask everybody to go ahead and subscribe to the uh to the Trippet Ranch channel because if you haven't already, well, there's not a whole lot I can do. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you.